Welcome to worship as we gather digitally once again this week. My name is Ann Harbridge, and together with Stacy Mortson, Reverend Dennis Posner, we serve Trinity Centennial United Church in Rosemont. We continue to worship online until the end of February as we wait for COVID numbers and hospitalizations to continue to go down. Stay tuned, and we will let you know when in-person worship will resume. And now I invite you to find a quiet place and prepare for worship. If you have a candle in your worship space, I invite you to light it now as we light this Christ candle. The Christ candle is a symbol of the light of Christ, the light that leads us when darkness overwhelms, it is the light that gives us hope in the midst of despair, it is the light that illuminates our pathway forward. As we begin our worship, we acknowledge that the land on which we live, work, play, and pray is the, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg peoples, including, including the Adawa, the Ojibwa, and the Potawatomi nations, known together as the Three Fires Confederacy. May we live with respect and in harmony with all those who share the earth with us. Be thankful to God as we move into a peaceful and healthy future. Holy One, you challenge us to forgive, to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, but it isn't easy. Inspire us and grant us the patience to journey with you, to allow ourselves at times to stumble, and when we do, to turn to you, so that we might fully experience your love, grace, and peace in this world that may, we may become a people of full of love and grace and forgiveness towards others. In this time of worship, may we find the inspiration to live into the lives you call us to. Please join me in the prayer of approach. Creator God, this is the day that you have made, a holy day, a day to put aside the ways of the world and to come into your presence. We come rejoicing and glad. Remove us from our distractions and worries, from our to-do lists and the stress of our day-to-day -day living. Fill our hearts with peace. Let us sing for joy. Even as we worship apart, help us to feel community around us. Help us through your love to know the love of our neighbors. Be with us and surround us 
with your grace and your peace. Amen. And our hymn is from Voices United, number 299, Teach Me God to Wonder. reading today is taken from Luke chapter 6 verses 27 to 38. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. I'm gonna have to change that. I had the pronunciation wrong or the emphasis wrong there. And our second reading today is taken from Luke Chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. This is the word of God. 
Thanks Thanks be be to God. Today's Hebrew scriptures and the gospel lesson for today go well together. But in order to get the connection, you need to know the story of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph was the youngest and favored child of Jacob, born to him in his later years. He had 11 stepbrothers, who because of Joseph's favorita- Jacob's favoritism toward Joseph, were not particularly fond of their younger brother. Have you seen the movie or the play Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat? It tells the story of Joseph, which begins in the 37th chapter of Genesis and continues to the end of that book, where in chapter 50, it tells us that Joseph died at the age of 110. His story begins when he is just 17 years old. He had a dream, which he shared with his brothers. In his dream, he and the brothers are in a field gathering wheat, and all of a sudden, his bundle stood up straight, and the brothers' bundles all bowed down to him. In a second dream, he tells his brothers and his parents that the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed down to him. Well, if the brothers weren't already jealous of this favored son, his dreams certainly didn't gain him any favor. And so one day when Jacob sent Joseph off to join his brothers in tending the sheep, the brothers were ready. By the time he found them, they had plotted to kill him and dump him into an old well. He had one brother, Reuben, who intervened and said no to murder, but you can still throw him down the well. While Reuben was away, a caravan came by and the brothers sold Joseph into slavery. When Reuben returned and fretted about what to tell their father about this favorite son of his, the brothers decided to take Joseph's treasured coat, dip it in blood and take it to their father, claiming that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. In the meantime, Joseph ended up in Egypt and was sold to Pontfar, one of Pharaoh's officials. Life was good for a while, but then Joseph wound up in jail. I won't go into detail, but you can read the whole story in Genesis 39. But even in jail, God was with Joseph, and his life was actually relatively good. Eventually, Joseph began to interpret the dreams of the other prisoners. Word reached the Pharaoh that Joseph had this ability, and so he called on him to interpret his own dreams as no one else had been able to. Turns out that the Pharaoh's dreams were about the famine to come and that he would need to store up reserves in order to feed the people during that famine. Because Joseph had been clever enough to interpret the Pharaoh's dream, he was put in charge of the entire country of Egypt and he was treated very generously. During the next seven years, the land produced bumper crops and Joseph managed to gather and store food in all the cities of Egypt. And then the famine struck. That's where we pick up the story of Jacob and his sons, still living in the land of Canaan. Egypt was the only place now that had food. As the famine got worse, Jacob learned that there was food in Egypt, and so he sent his sons to see what they could buy. And who do you think they had to deal with when they got there? Joseph, of course, because he was in charge of rationing out the food. The brothers didn't recognize him at first, but he recognized them. Again, I won't give you all the details of what happened. You can read that in Genesis 42 to 44 to find out. It's quite a story of intrigue, hardship, trickery, and adventure. No wonder they made a movie of it. Imagine after all those years, somewhere around 30 years after his brothers had sold him into slavery, coming face to face with the ones who had betrayed you. But no, rather than punishing his brothers, Joseph sent for his father and welcomed his brothers and their whole families into the land of Egypt. Not only did he welcome them, but he saw to it that the Pharaoh gave them land in Goshen to bring their sheep flocks and to settle their families. It's not the end of the story for Joseph and his family, but it's as far as we'll go today. So have you got the tie-in to our gospel lesson for today? The sixth chapter of Luke is often referred to as Jesus' Sermon on the Plain. Stacy talked about that very sermon 
as she talked about the Beatitudes last week. As she said, the sermon Jesus offered is very similar to Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount. Similar, but different. Luke's version begins with some Beatitudes, similar to those in Matthew, and it goes on to offer blessings to the poor, the deprived, the sorrowful, and the persecuted. He talks about the tragedy of being rich and forces us to think about how heaven's system is far different than the ways of the world in which we live. And then he goes on to give seven startling commands. Love your enemies. Must we? Do good to those who hate you. Seriously? When have they done good to me? Bless those who curse you. But they don't deserve it. Pray for those who abuse you. How do we pray when we are hurting? If anyone strikes you, turn the other cheek. What? And let them strike me again? If someone takes your coat, give them your shirt also. But I've worked hard for my things. And finally, do unto others as you would have them do to you. But what about revenge? None of these commandments is easy. In fact, they are downright challenging. Joseph's story is a wonderful example of how forgiveness can lead us to living out these commandments. Joseph could have been harsh and taken revenge out on his brothers in response to their actions, but instead he chose to move forward. Once he reveals himself to them, he tells them to go back and bring their father to Egypt, where all of them will live in comfort and peace. And Joseph does not renege on the promise or on his forgiveness. He settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, in Goshen, as Pharaoh had directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all of their families with food. He certainly doesn't sound like a man who's holding a grudge or has hatred in his heart. So how do we continue in our own journey of forgiveness? Again, Joseph gives us the answer. He tells his brothers not to be distressed or angry with themselves for selling him because it was to save lives that God sent him ahead. So it wasn't they who sent him to Egypt, it was God. Complete and total forgiveness. Not only forgiveness, but almost gratitude for their actions. Forgiveness can free us from carrying with us the hurt and anger that prevents us from living out the commandments that Jesus gave to us. When I listed those commandments, I named some of the thoughts we might have when told to live out each one. What if we were to adjust our thinking and consider a better alternative than anger or revenge? Love your enemies. Perhaps we could consider what makes them our enemy. Is it because we don't know them? Are we afraid of them? What if we spent some time trying to understand their perspective? What is that saying? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer? Perhaps spending time with one another will help us to know one another in ways that can heal whatever it is that made us enemies in the first place. Do good to those who hate you. Isn't there another saying about attracting flies with honey? or kindness begets kindness. God teaches us to love, not to hate. And love is contagious. Love can turn even a hardened heart soft. We can certainly use a whole lot more love and kindness in our world today. Bless those who curse you. I find this one a tough one. It's natural to resent those who speak unkindly of us or hurt us in any way. Perhaps we need to think about why they behave the way they do. We don't know what others are dealing with, how they might be hurting. Perhaps by blessing them with our time, our attention, and our kindness, we can help them to overcome whatever bitterness they are harboring. Pray for those who abuse you. How does one pray for those who abuse us? Perhaps we start by praying for them in the same way we pray for ourselves when we can't find the words. Perhaps the words of the Lord's Prayer is a good place to start. 
ask for the same things for your enemy as you would ask for yourself, a relationship with God. If anyone strikes you, turn the other cheek. What exactly does that mean? I don't think it means to literally turn the other cheek. In fact, the dictionary's definition of turn the other cheek is to refrain from retaliating when one has been attacked or insulted. It's a deliberate decision to remain calm and to not respond when someone has made us angry. In the end, our actions will say more about ourselves than about the one who has attacked us. If someone takes your coat, give them your shirt also. In the message, this verse is written as, if someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. This verse is about generosity, and generosity is one of the gifts of the Spirit that prepare us for the kingdom of heaven. There's a story about a winter fair where everyone was all bundled up, waiting for the announcement for the winner of a trip to the Caribbean. Everyone was bundled up except for one man. He stood there in his shirt sleeves and shorts, shivering. Someone offered him a pair of mittens and a scarf, but that was it. Finally, the judges made their announcement. The winner of the trip was the man in shorts. And when asked why, the contest officials explained that this man won the trip to the Caribbean simply because he was the only person who was dressed for the Caribbean. Using the gifts of the Spirit given to us by God, prepare us for entry into the kingdom of heaven. And finally, do unto others as you would have them do to you. These words, often referred to as the golden rule, they pretty much sum up all of the other verses. What is so enduring about the golden rule is that it's reciprocal. The rule keeps us within a relationship with one another. It assumes that we live in community. Whatever you have done, you do it for somebody else. However you want to be treated, you treat everyone else that way. If there's a word you want to hear from someone else, you offer that word first. Living by the golden rule means you take other people seriously, particularly when they are in need. If we go back to the story of Joseph, when he was confronted by his brothers, he could have easily treated them the way they had treated him, you know, an eye for an eye. But instead, he treated them the way he wanted them to treat him. He forgave them and moved forward, treating them with kindness and love. He did for his brothers not what they did for him, but what he would have wanted them to do. He lived out the golden rule. Whenever you are confronted by an opportunity to judge another, whenever you are confronted by an opportunity to help another, in fact, every opportunity that you have to interact with another, Remember Jesus' Sermon on the Plain and his seven startling commandments. And most of all, live your life by the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It isn't easy. In fact, I don't know anyone who can do it all of the time. It's hard because we think to ourselves, if I love my enemies or I act kindly to those who hate me, curse me and harm me, there's no assurance that my enemy will be kind to me in return. I might still be hated, cursed, and harmed. What is missing in the golden rule is a means to handle those occasions when the community breaks down, when someone else doesn't live by the golden rule. A good deed for others gives no assurance that others will be good to you. That is the limit of the golden rule. And so we turn to God. Do you remember Jesus' last words from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Jesus prayed to God to help him with the golden rule during his final minutes of life. We too can turn to God for the strength to live the golden rule. And when we fail, we turn to God for forgiveness and the courage to try again. The golden rule is so important, in fact, that all the major faiths teach a version of it. The high faith, we read, blessed is he who preferreth his brother before himself. Buddhism, 
treat not others in ways that you yourself find hurtful. In Christianity, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Hinduism, this is the sum of duty, not to others what would cause pain. desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. Jainism, one that should treat all creatures in the world as one would like to be treated. In Judaism, what is hurtful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That is the entire law, all the rest is commentary. In Sikhism, we read precious like jewels are the minds of all. To hurt them is not at all good. If thou desirest thy love, beloved, and then hurt not thou in one's heart. And in Taoism, regard your neighbor's gain as your own gain, and your neighbor's loss as your own loss. If only all the world lived the golden rule, in whatever iteration it is taught, wouldn't this world be a better place? Now our next hymn isn't really a hymn, but it's a catchy little tune reminding us to follow the golden rule. Treat others like you want to be treated. Like you want to be treated. Like you want to be treated. Treat others like you want to be treated. Like you want to be treated. Treat other people the way you want to feel. Treat other people like your friends. Make them smile and laugh and you'll be smiling too Just follow the good old golden rule There's a golden rule out there for us to follow It's kind of like a road to happiness If I be nice to you, then you be nice to me We can live our lives in peace and harmony Treat other people the way you want to feel Treat other people like your friends Make them smile and laugh and you'll be smiling too Just follow that good old golden rule The golden rule will work for you at school The golden rule works wonders when you're home It'll keep on working great for you The golden rule your whole life through wherever we may roam Treat other people the way you want to feel Treat other people like your friends Make them smile and laugh and you'll be smiling too Just follow that good old golden rule Treat other people the way you want to feel Treat other people like your friends Make them smile and laugh and you'll be smiling too Just follow that good old golden rule Or just follow that good old golden rule Or just follow that good old golden rule I'm gonna follow that good old golden rule I'm gonna follow that 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 Now let us affirm our faith together. We believe in God, the one who chooses grace over grudges, who provides rather than withholding, 
the one who creates community with us and longs for us to create community with others. We believe in Jesus, our brother, who teaches us to love our neighbor as ourselves, who does good to those who do evil, who cradles the fists of hatred in his scarred hands. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the breath of wonder, which blows through our lives, whispering words of peace into hearts full of anger and words of love into hearts filled with hatred. Because we believe, we seek to live with grace, to love our neighbor, and to strive for peace. With God as our example, Christ as our teacher, and the Holy Spirit as our guide. Amen. When we offer what we have to help others, we are living the golden rule. Each gift given makes a difference to the one who receives it. Our gifts given for the work of the church and through the mission and service fund for the work of the wider church makes a difference. Let's sing our doxology, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. As we give thanks for all the gifts of time, talent, and money given to the church, we ask your blessing on both the gift and the giver. May we use all our gifts in ways that improves the lives of others. Amen. Maybe you could just introduce. Um... And now Reverend Dennis Posno will join us in saying the prayers of the people. As we gather in prayer, let us remember that prayer is a song we all can sing. It's a light that the blind can see. Prayer is a gift that the poor may bring, however poor they be. Prayer is a star that lights the way for those who are in despair. And when your heart kneels down to pray, God will hear your prayer. In the confidence of our faith, let us pray to the God who loves us and cares for us. We are a believing people, O oh God, who have embraced a faith which more than anything else proclaims your love for us, made real in Jesus Christ. But believing is hard sometimes, and faith, even when embraced, doesn't remove the struggles of life. Joy is challenged by sorrow. Peace is challenged by conflict. Hope is challenged by difficult moments. Courage is challenged by the things that fill us with fear and uncertainty. The times in which we live are strange times. For most of us, unprecedented times. The troubles at our border crossings, the protests in many of our cities, the occupation that is taking place in our nation's capital, the declaration of the Emergencies Act, the political rhetoric from all sides that in many ways only inflames the very real struggles we are facing fill us with worry and anxiety. The situation in Ukraine with rumors of war remind us that the reality of international conflict is very real. And for two years, our lives have been turned upside down and inside out and we're tired and weary and wanting COVID-19 to be over, yet knowing that we still need to be 
vigilant and cautious and prudent. And still life goes on the day to day. Grant us the grace to be patient. Grant us the grace to count our blessings. Help us to find ways to be thankful for what we have. Grant us, even in the midst of our own sorrows and struggles, the grace to use our voices and hands and hearts and actions to stand with those who need to know they do not stand alone. Still, when faced with the things that can break our hearts, we are blessed in the knowledge that faith isn't just us holding on to you. It is knowing that you are holding on to us. There is much on our hearts today, O oh God. And now in the quietness of this moment, we lift up our personal prayers to you. We offer our prayers in Jesus' name, and in his words we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A closing hymn is Love Never Fails, written and sung by my good friend, Reverend Dr. Candace Bist. matter what the grief how deep 
time of worship our hearts filled with God's love we go to offer the wonder of laughter and hope to everyone we meet we seek ways to treat others as we hope to be treated and we pray for a world where all may live in peace and harmony go now and live the golden rule in every way and every place you go with everyone you meet amen <laughs> 